Well, I am just delighted to be here and uh, thank you to everyone who made this possible, to the, to the MAA for the invitation and the various people who have uh, helped me put this, uh, this talk together. Um, thanks to the National Science Foundation for financial support for this work. Um, there is a code base and it is available at, uh, on GitHub. Um, I'd like to thank my collaborators at Portland State, um, J.R. Srungavarapu and er Eric Tsai. And also big thanks to Verified Voting um, who uh, took the back end system that we wrote at Portland State and put it out uh, for the public in a place that anyone can use it. So um, when you work in elections, people are constantly asking you who's gonna win the next election. And uh, I, I hate that question, or at least I used to until I realized that I could understand it as, tell me something interesting about the election that's going on, uh, because I hate making predictions, especially about the future. But I'm going to make an exception today, and I will make a prediction about the next hour. So in the next hour, you will hear about the vote visualizer, which is the system that we built. Uh, I will show you some outliers from the 2020 general election. Um, I will talk about what made this project hard, and I will give you some ideas of projects that students might do based on this work. Uh, Stephanie, how would it be if I introduce you first? Oh my gosh, that would be perfect. <laughs> Don't uh. it, but uh, maybe I'll just take a moment. I'll introduce <laughs> you and then you can share your slides while you talk. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was wondering what felt funny about this. <laughs> <laughs> details, details. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so um, if we're ready on the, on the back end, I'll go ahead and start with the introduction. Okay, great. So, hi everyone, my name is Moon Duchin and I am delighted to be here today virtually with you from my kitchen um, with an opportunity to introduce Stephanie Singer, who's a remarkable individual. So, um, Stephanie has had multiple careers already and is still going and um, began working in math and computer science, which she studied at Yale, Stanford, and NYU has a research career in geometric analysis, um, was a professor um, in a liberal arts atmosphere, and then an elected official in Philadelphia, and now is doing some really interesting work in the data science around elections and cybersecurity. Um, I've gotten to know Stephanie a little bit in the last year or two. In particular, we served together on the board of advisors for Vote Shield, which is uh, an outfit that does anomaly detection in voter registration files. So when you see some of the news about vulnerabilities and hacking in voter registration databases, that's the kind of work that we're thinking about in that context. Um, she's done some really <laughs> remarkable things in different contexts. One is that in her work in Pennsylvania, she brought the I voted today sticker uh, into action. That's actually, for me, that's a really great reminder that some of the work in the election space is kind of big and data rich. And some of it is just nitty gritty and physical and material like that sticker that does such important work in making people feel civically engaged. Um, these days she works with uh, numerous outfits including verified voting and you'll hear more about her work with verified voting as we continue. And she's affiliated with the Hatfield School of Government at Portland State University. Also notably this week, she's got a really provocative and interesting op-ed in the Washington Post. I'll drop the link for that into the chat so that you can all see that. Um, and it's about what to do when you feel that your election was stolen. So maybe it's uh, <clears throat> advice for a certain individual in, <laughs> in Washington. So um, all in all, you put all this together, there's a really interesting past, a really interesting present, and a really interesting future uh, in Stephanie's work that I am looking forward to finding out about. And so with that, I will remind everyone who's attending to please throw questions into the Q&A. Um, I'll be moderating that. 
And I'll interrupt Stephanie only if there are clarifying questions. And otherwise, I'll try to curate some of those questions for 10 of when the talk ends. Um, and so with that, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Stephanie Singer. So uh, Moon, did did uh, was I public before when I started my talk ahead of time? Or should I yes. start from the beginning yes. again? And we're hearing responses in the chat, in particular people hoping that there will be slides. <laughs> OK, so so I should start from the beginning. Yes, that would be great. OK, well, it is fantastic to be here. Moon, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, thank you, MAA, for the invitation. Um, I'm Stephanie Singer, and I will be talking about uh, detecting anomalies in the 2020 election. Uh, this is work I did at the Hatfield School of Government in Portland, at Portland State University with uh, Eric Sai and, uh, and Regu Srungavarapu. Um, and I'll also be talking about some, some related, some work I did in conjunction with Verified Voting, which is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization uh, that, um, that helped design and put the front end on the work that we did so that the public can use it, which is an important part. Do share your slides if you haven't. Oh, yes. I have not shared my slides. Okay. You know, it, no matter how much you practice these things, right, they're still, um, they are still difficult. Hold on. I'm just not, I'm not seeing my Zoom control. Uh, window. Can you click down at the bottom and they should light up, Stephanie, and then you should see share screen? I'm, so I am not seeing that at all. Um, oh, okay. I always think that talks about technology are the most likely to have these fun technology glitches. <laughs> um, I know you were sharing your slides just uh, when we were practicing about 10 minutes ago. Yes, so. I, um, I just, I cannot for the life of me see the Zoom control panel, which is where you have the, oh, so, oh, wait, wait, wait. I think maybe I know where it went. Okay, hold on. All right. You're getting we're, we're, we're getting from... there. We are getting there. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's go back. All right. How's this? Success. Ah, oh, success. Okay, so um, yeah, okay, so I will just keep going here. Okay, so I hate making predictions, um, but I will predict that in the next hour, you will hear about the vote visualizer, which is the system we built. Uh, you will hear something about uh, outliers in the 2020 general election that just passed. You will hear something about uh, what makes this project difficult um, because we try to make it look easy, but under the hood, there's some stuff going on. And finally, I wanna leave you with some ideas for student projects that uh, you might think about assigning your students based on this work. So the, the story behind this work is the story of uh, how election, um, irregularities uh, that are due to malfeasance get found. And, uh, and the way this is, you know, I think of this as part of cybersecurity. For cybersecurity, you need uh, resilience. You need to be able to detect and correct things that go wrong. And it's not just for cyber things. It's really for anything. This, this example is not a cyber example at all. Um, but in 2018, in North Carolina, after the um, after the initial results were released, the chart on the left was uh, was published on the blog of a political consultant and uh, college professor, 
Um, and uh, what he noticed and everybody noticed was that in this chart, Bladen County was really different from the other counties. Now, what is this chart? This is a chart of the vote breakdown, the vote share between two candidates um, in the ninth congressional district in North Carolina. And it is the vote share on the absentee ballots only. So uh, the discovery of this anomaly in Bladen County and that in conjunction with rumors that people heard on the ground about things that might or might not be happening, uh, they led eventually to, a, um, to the North Carolina Board of Elections actually uh, refusing to certify this contest. They found that someone had cheated on the absentee ballots in Bladen County. Um, now, this is really, really rare that a Board of Elections doesn't certify and they say, nope, we're going to do this election entirely over. So I was interested in the role that data analysis played here. It played the role of strengthening the case for doing an investigation. It played the role of putting pressure on the Board of Elections to explain this, uh, this outlier. Uh, because I'll tell you, there are tons of outliers that, that come up in elections. Um, and usually there's uh, people who know the district can offer an, a plausible explanation. But in this case, nobody could. So the problem, if, you, if what you're after is for the, um, to really make a difference to protecting the election, uh, you need to understand the election timelines. So um, in November, you have the election. Shortly after that, there are preliminary results released. Um, at some point in November, the final results are released and the winners typically are certified. Um, so this is the presidential timetable is different. This is for uh, uh, things, you know, direct elections that happen in a state. Um, okay, and then and then the winners start work in in January. And uh, some of the official voter data isn't available even till late January, depending on the size of the county and and how things work. So in the the crucial, the really crucial period is. Uh, before the certification, because that's the place where you can easily push for investigations and you can easily, um, uh, well, yeah, so that's the time, that's really the, the critical time to push for investigations. After the winners are certified, it gets much, much harder to take action. And then um, after the winners actually are sworn in and start work, um, with rare exceptions, it is just game over. So the issue is how do you do this analysis quickly? Uh, so there are two products from this work uh, so far. Uh, one is the public website at verifiedvoting.org vote visualizer. And uh, please, if you get bored during the talk or during any talk, <laughs> go, go on over there and play around with it. Um, uh, the second, uh, public uh, product is a code repository uh, that has the back end of the code that takes the takes files from as you get them from the state boards of election in whatever format those state boards happen to publish them. This code gives you a way to consolidate them into a single format actually into a single database. You can export them into the uh, NIST common data format, which I'll talk a little more about later. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what, uh, it, it's open source um, and, and it's, it's designed to be used, although I should say it's only a little over a year old. So uh, we're still working on uh, meeting all our aspirations for it. Um, Okay, so what is the what does the vote visualizer do? This website with the back end code that I described. Well, it curates. One thing it does is it curates outliers for you, so you can pick, say, uh, say the twenty eighteen general North Carolina congressional ninth district contest, and you can ask, show me show me uh, the most interesting outliers because there's lots of ways to slice and dice the the ballots and lots of different bar charts to draw. 
but which one has which ones have an outlier and which ones are interesting. So uh, the visualizer curates the outliers for you. Uh, it will present a few. And uh, roughly speaking, um, and I can go into the details of the, of the algorithm in the question period if people are interested, but um, that's really not the most interesting part. Um, so uh, it tells you, so it, it shows you the outliers and it also shows you, if you look down at the bottom in the red, it says margin uh, about 900, outlier widened margin by about 300. This tells you that, that this outlier actually was a significant part of the margin that allowed the winner to win. And that means in a practical way, this is an outlier that is of interest to the loser because if this outlier turns out to be not genuinely based on the will of the people, then that is a huge step towards an argument that the loser can make to say, hey, the winner did not actually win. Another thing the vote visualizer does is it draws scatter plots. So if you take a, a single state such as North Carolina, you can draw all kinds of things. There are all kinds of different counts by county and you can compare any two that you like. So this example that I drew is the same example from 2018. I drew the, the I asked the system to create a scatter plot of the, um, the votes for one candidate versus the, the votes for the other candidate by county and, and what, well, the, so the point is that you have this outlier, you can visually, your eye picks out this outlier. Um, so those are the two things that the vote visualizer does. Um, and uh, let me just show you some of the stuff from 2020. Um, I think the upshot of 2020 is uh, uh, we did a bunch of looking around. We didn't find anything that looked um, <laughs> we didn't find anything that looked suspicious. So uh, that is, that's the, I guess, the headline for our analysis of 2020. Um, we had, uh, so what did we manage in this, the first election that we really ran this system and we really collected election results live, you know, in that, in that window, in that tight time window, we had a, um, a priority list of 22 states and we collected all of them and posted all of them within a, a week to 10 days of the publication of the results. Um, so, uh, so for example, we found things like this. So this is the uh, Iowa Congressional District 3. And if you look at the, mar the margin of the contest was 6,000 and this outlier in Polk County, that's the one all the way to the left is Polk County. And, and uh, you can see it's different from the others. Uh, that outlier widened the margin by, um, by 51,000. So, so basically Polk County won the election for, for the winner. The winner was uh, Cindy Axney. Um, so, I mean, when you look at that on the chart, you're like, whoa, that's an outlier, what happened? And then you look at the demographics of these counties and you find out that Polk County is where Des Moines is and Polk County is overwhelmingly democratic and the other counties are uh, smaller and, and more Republican. So yes, it's an outlier. No, it's not a suspicious outlier because uh, a, a very easy investigation reveals a really plausible explanation. Uh, so uh, here's another example of a, of a chart and I find it I find it useful the system doesn't but I find it useful to look at the uh, just to draw the line x equals y to see what's going on. Uh, on the horizontal axis here we have um, th these are all votes for president in Pennsylvania by county and on the horizontal axis we have votes cast on absentee ballots. And on the vertical axis, we have votes cast on election day. These were the two primary ways of casting votes in Pennsylvania in this past election. Um, and, and, you know, you can see there's, there's a, a basic trend. Uh, you can see that in most counties, um, in most counties, more people went to the polls than, than uh, cast absentee ballots with the exception of Philadelphia. 
Um, and if you're interested in, in Pennsylvania electoral politics, you can, and on the live system, you can actually mouse over and, and you can see for each point, you can see what county it is. And also you can see the, the exact coordinates of the point. Um, so, uh, okay, I, uh, <laughs> I spent hours on any one of these charts because I know Pennsylvania, but I, I will try to move on. <laughs> okay, here's a chart from California. And again, uh, let me put in the X equals Y line. Um, so this is another kind of chart you can ask the, the system to draw. So state house districts tend to be small. They tend to not involve very many counties. So if you did just a single state house district, you, you probably wouldn't get much very interesting typically. Um, but you can also say, tell me, uh, show me here on the horizontal, we have all votes cast for Republican state house candidates in the 2016 general election. And you can compare that with the 2020 general election, the same thing, all Republican state house votes cast for state house. Um, and when I say Republican, I mean for the Republican candidate. Uh, of course, we, we, yeah, I mean for how on those ballots, you're looking at the ballots here. Um, and, and again, so each of these outliers has a story. And I don't know California, so I don't know what the story is. Um, but what's going on in Santa Clara? Why were there so many more votes? for Republican state house candidates in Santa Clara County this year than four years ago. Um, maybe there was a much better candidate. Maybe, uh, maybe there were demographic shifts in Santa Clara. Um, again, that I don't know the explanation, but the graph gives me pointed questions to ask. What's happened between Orange County and San Diego County? Um, and so on and so on. Um, and, and I want to give one uh, cautionary tale, which is that sometimes uh, you have a scatter plot. Uh, sometimes you can see an outlier, and it's really an outrageous outlier, like in this plot, which, um, which is actually mislabeled. Uh, this is from my own election, primary election for city commissioner in Philadelphia in 2011. And it's one ward, a pretty fairly homogeneous ward by population. And if you, uh, you'll notice that there's one extreme outlier up there. Um, and again, the, the, the labels on the axes are incorrect. They should be switched. It was an outlier in my favor. <laughs> and, um, you know, it looks pretty bad, right? Uh, and if that outlier had been challenged and someone had said, explain that, otherwise we think you stuffed the ballot box in that precinct, uh, luckily I would have an explanation. I would say, yeah, that's the precinct where my daughter was outside all day saying, vote for my mom, vote for my mom, vote for my mom. Um, and one of the nice things here is that what this story shows is, is that it shows how many votes she got for me, which is a, a question you always want to know when you're campaigning. You know, you have these, all these options, you know, should I put this person here? Should I do this mailer? Should I do this? Should I do the other thing? These outliers can really start to answer that question for a political scientist um, because it tells you where to go look, a hundred votes. So I, I knew she was gonna get me a lot of votes, <laughs> but I didn't know she was gonna get me on the order of a hundred votes. So that's the kind of thing that you can do with this system. So, well, this, Maybe this all looks easy. I mean, what have I done here? Um, I mean, the, so Verify Voting built that nice looking website. I, I didn't do any of the design, <laughs> okay? Um, um, so the, the algorithm to curate outliers is, it's really naive. It's really, uh, yeah, it's really naive. Um, and the outlier for drawing scatter plots, well, there's, there's no algorithm actually. Uh, it, we're just drawing scatter plots. We're just offering counts and scatter plots. And I mean, that's, there's no math in that, okay? There's just presenting data. Um, so, so why did this take so long to put together? 
<laughs> Why is this hard? Well, it's hard because of the way the data comes in. Um, so there are uh, every state board of elections, uh, and by state, I include the territories and the District of Columbia. Um, every state board of elections has makes its own choice about what format to offer its election results in. Uh, so uh, most, most, if they give you an Excel or a, a comma separated text or a tab separated text file, if they, if they give it to you in a chart, uh, most of them will put the counties uh, along, the, along the side. Um, but Utah puts them along the top. Why not? Um, the bottom here is from the state of Texas. They have an idiosyncratic nested JSON format that they use. Um, in Nevada, all we found was HTML. So we just cut and paste, um, which breaks my heart. I want things to be automated. <laughs> um, and some have only PDFs um, and, and not PDFs that are easy to copy from. Um, and then you have, uh, in addition to their, their overall choices about format, uh, there are just idiosyncrasies. So Oregon, my home state, uh, they give you a nice set of uh, comma separated charts, um, but there are some lines are longer than others. Um, Colorado, sometimes a number will have an, an asterisk by it. Um, in New Hampshire, they have one character party abbreviations, uh, except sometimes they, they, they give the Libertarian Party three characters. Um, but sometimes, but not always. Uh, and Alaska reports by state house district, not by county, you know, and on and on and on. So there are all these differences. Um, so, uh, and, and so as you go through this process, you know, you might start with a state actually like North Carolina. North Carolina is actually very generous with its data. And, you know, you get it in tabular form. Um, and as you go on, you see differences and differences and differences and, and you think, okay, now I've seen it all. Now maybe I've seen it all. Now maybe I've seen it all and then there's something new. So, uh, you know, things like uh, Maine, if you want the name of the contest, you have to combine information from the name of the file. This tells you it's a congressional file with uh, information about the sheet. Uh, so district one, so to get U.S. Congress District One, you have to look at the um, at the name of the file and the name of the sheet together. None of these are a big deal, uh, but um, in and of themselves, but there are just so many of them. So Maine also uh, sometimes they label counties by C O U N T Y, and sometimes they label them by C T Y, and uh, you just have to be ready for that. Uh, Connecticut, uh, they put junk in the candidate name field. Uh, Biden, Harris, machine polling place, EDR, Absti, total, that's the name of the candidate. Um, and they also uh, put many different blocks of information onto one Excel sheet, um, which I just wish they'd put them on separate sheets. Uh, okay. Uh, Oh, and by the way, if you think I'm picking on, on New England, uh, <laughs> I think New England is picking on me uh, because it's interesting because I'm sure there's all kinds of culture about it. It's pretty clear that in New England, these things are put together by hand. Um, and uh, that must just be something cultural about New England. Okay, in North Carolina, um, they give you this nice tabular form, uh, but they also do this thing where they, the, the sheet is reporting things by precinct, but they also treat, say, all the absentee votes from one county as a single precinct in, for their reporting. So you have to pay attention. You have to get that right. Um, New Hampshire. Um, okay, bored yet? I'm bored. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So, so there's just on and on the, you know, little asterisks in places. Um, Missouri, uh, they put the candidate and the party in one cell of the Excel sheet. So you need to do some regular ex uh, expression work to pull them apart. 
Uh, Minnesota, why not use semicolons to separate instead of a comma or a tab? I mean, why not? <laughs> I know actually why they don't use a comma. Using a comma is dumb because sometimes uh, candidate names have commas in them. Um, you know, Joseph R. Biden Jr., comma, Jr. in a lot of places. So I, I know why they put in the semicolon, but okay, I have to write a little bit of extra code to uh, get that semicolon. Um, and all this stuff, we did as much of this stuff as we could in advance, um, but then there's also the issue that the unofficial results that come out right before the, uh, I mean, just after the election uh, might be in a completely different form from the ones that you can get over the course of the year for previous elections. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, and this was just uh, this week, Tennessee, uh, you know, really, I thought I'd seen it all. And then I, then here comes Tennessee with multiple candidates on multiple lines. So, so on that first line, it's not just the Donald J. Trump line. It's also the Joseph R. Biden line. And th there are other columns, many other columns to the left of this uh, with the counts for Biden and the counts for various other candidates. Um, yeah, so... Um, so none of these, none of these one by one, none of them are really a big deal, but uh, we're talking about 56 different jurisdictions. And if I can remind you of the timeline, in order for this to be useful to protect elections, you have to get it done in this short timeline. Now, now that we've done this huge body of work, the next election is going to be a lot easier because um, it's um, uh, be because, you know, there will surely be changes, the states who change their formats, but they won't all change them all at once. Um, I should also say that there are a bunch of states that use a particular format from a particular vendor. So there are private companies who offer to boards of election the service of posting their results on election night. Um, and several states use the same one. Um, so, you know, Georgia, Arkansas, South Carolina, and, and several others all use the same format, which is in XML. Um, and that is, you know, that's great for us. It's a uniform format. It makes all that very quick. Um, so, um, yeah, so the dream is that there would be one format that they would all use. And the good news is that the National Institute of Standards and Technology has created such a format. Uh, it's the common data format. And, um, and uh, our system actually will uh, export the data into that format. So part of what we're hoping is that if we do all this work, nobody else has to. Um, they can just download stuff from us if, if they'd like to do that. Um, and a big, huge shout out to Ohio. Thank you, Ohio. You used the NIST common data format and you made it available publicly for anyone who wants it. And, um, and that's huge. And I, I would urge any of you uh, actually, this is a, a reasonable student project. It's not exactly a math project, but uh, to find out in your state, if you, if you don't live in Ohio, find out who can make the decision to uh, put the data out in the NIST common data format. Who is it at the State Board of Elections? And uh, how might that person be convinced to make it happen? That would really be uh, a huge contribution. So uh, I want to tell you what the um, mathiest insight is from my point of view, uh, since in some sense, there's not a lot of math in this. Um, uh, I mean, like, like a lot of math, like a lot of applied math, the, the math itself is not always difficult. Um, the real difficulty is knowing the domain, knowing the context well enough to know. Um, so, um, okay, so the mathiest insight here is that there are, in all these different formats, there are essentially only two different data structures. Either you have a table of 
counts uh, like you see on the left here. Um, or, so that's your, your Excel, your uh, comma separated or tab separated or semicolon separated uh, uh, files, text files. Or you have some kind of tree structure. That's the, the nested JSON from Texas is a tree. The uh, XML from, the, um, from that, that one vendor uh, that does South Carolina and Georgia and, and Arkansas and several others, that's a tree. And the NIST XML format is a tree. So, um, so that was the, the mathiest insight. And, and what that allowed was uh, that allowed us to kind of after we'd gone through and seen so many states, that allowed us to, to organize the process of dealing with a new file. Um, and to my mind, and I'm actually, I'm gonna go back to a previous slide here. Um, to my mind, that's a, that is a real contribution that might possibly get overlooked. So, um, so this is the slide and I don't know if you can see um, on, on the left, um, this, is, this is basically our basic intake, intake questionnaire um, about the file. And the list of questions is pretty simple. And that simplicity is the result of a lot of hard work. Okay. Uh, so, and that's in the code repository, anyone who wants to take a closer look at it. Um, and, and we really did our best to, um, we really did our best to uh, document the code repository so that, uh, so that uh, other people can use it. Um, I should say, uh, again, this is all work in progress and um, we would love feedback, even if your feedback is, I tried to do X and I looked here in the documentation and it didn't help me. <laughs> That's really helpful. Okay, so uh, coming soon, or maybe it's even up today, uh, is a, a, a way to download the NIST common data format. To, and, and so far we just, we're, we have a way for you to download it for a single state and contest, uh, sorry, not, not contest, for a single state in a single election year. Um, and um, we're, we're working on, on um, letting you through the web interface, download everything we have. Um, if you're seriously interested in getting everything we have, uh, just, you know, let me know um, because we're happy to provide it. Um, it's just a question of uh, resources to build the Build the public interface. Interface. Okay. So, I promised you that I would talk a little bit about student projects uh, that could be based on this, and uh, and so here are some suggestions. So one suggestion, very simple, is to uh, ask your students to to go to the visualizer and draw scatter plots until you find one with an outlier. And believe me, it will not take long. And once you found an outlier, find the explanation for the outlier. So, um, so here's an example. And this is an example from Tuesday's, Tuesday's uh, runoff elections in Georgia. And notice that was Tuesday, this is Friday. Uh, I made this slide yesterday. Um, once we're set up to, to take in the data from, a, uh, from a, a jurisdiction, it's really, really easy to take in the new data. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased with that, very pleased with that. Um, okay, so what are you looking at here? So all of this has to do with the contest between uh, John Ossoff and David Perdue. And uh, what I decided to look at was um, absentee mail ballots with votes in this contest. I wanted to look at the runoff versus the November election. So, 
So what happened in Georgia was in, in November, there were a bunch of candidates running and uh, there, no one candidate had over 50%. So um, Ossoff and Purdue were both very close to that, um, but neither actually hit the 50% mark because there were other candidates in the contest. And under Georgia law, that means there has to be a runoff directly between these two so that one of them will get more than 50%. Um, and so uh, the November election is on the vertical. The runoff election that happened <clears throat> on Tuesday is on the horizontal. And <clears throat> each dot is a, is a Georgia county. And, and again, on the live site, you would be able to mouse over and see at, you know, in real time, which, which dot is which. Um, but uh, so one thing, I mean, that's, that you can read off of this uh, is that more votes were cast on absentee ballots in the November election than were cast in the runoff. Um, Okay, and you can also look and you see that there is a distinct outlier down there in Henry County. Uh, it is really off the trend line. And you can just ask why and I, I don't know why I mean I'm my educated guess would probably be that since these are these results um, for the runoff were um, I got them on Wednesday uh, after the Tuesday election. And maybe for the runoff, Henry County was just slow to report its absentee ballots. You know, that, that could be what it is. Um, but maybe not, I don't know. So, so that putting a task to a student of saying, actually talk to the board of elections, talk to the candidate campaign, you know, talk to someone at the campaign, uh, talk to a reporter who covers that beat and find out um, what, what happened in Henry County. Um, so, so it's, it's an easy and flexible assignment and uh, they are guaranteed to learn something interesting about how complicated elections are. Um, another, if you're looking for, for a, a different level of student project, uh, you could ask students to implement a, a new and different outlier algorithm. So the algorithm that we have um, it really is, it's the first algorithm that came to hand. We, we took the, um, uh, well, why don't I actually show you a little bit? Um, so this, this is, example is from the ninth congressional district in, in uh, 2018 in North Carolina, of course. Um, so uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but um, on the left is the raw count scatter plot. Uh, for for that contest, on the right, instead of doing a scatter plot of the raw counts, we did a scatter plot of the um, of the vote share between the two candidates. So you take you take the the total votes for those two candidates, ignoring all the other candidates in the contest. You take the total votes that were cast for those two candidates, and you. Um, uh, each candidate's share is, is uh, a percentage of that. And of course, those, the two shares add up to one. So they're on the line X, uh, you know, X plus Y equals one. And you look for, uh, you use something called Z-score to look for the, um, uh, the point that is the highest number of standard deviations from the mean of the others. Um, now you have to have enough counties for this to even to make sense to do. Um, and, then, and then what you do is you, you, um, you take that outlier and you just move it back on this graph to the, to the closest, to the one closest to it. And that's like you're on the, on the raw count graph, it's as if you're, you take this point and you move it. Um, back closer to, to the, to the line. Um, so, uh, so here you, you know, like take this Bladen point and move it to match Cumberland. Um, here, you're not going to get an exact match because if one county is bigger than the other, you won't get the exact thing, but, um, um, but that's how you do it. 
And so now you have, instead of the actual vote count, uh, you have an adjusted vote count. I mean, it's just a fictional vote count. Um, another way to see this is that is you take the Bladen County vote share and you just change it to the Cumberland County vote share. So this is the actual, Bladen and Cumberland are different. In the adjusted, Bladen now looks just like Cumberland. Um, and that is, of course, going to change the um, that is going to change the actual totals for sorry that'll change the totals for each candidate. You'll have an actual totals and an adjusted total, and then you'll have um, uh, and that will that will change the counts of the the candidates, and so it will change the margin uh, between the two candidates. So the if you look at the adjustment. The, the 900 vote margin that's in the actual results, it gets reduced by 300. So that's, uh, that's our algorithm for, for modeling the importance of the outlier. Okay, so that's our algorithm. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a really naive algorithm. First of all, we're just picking out one county um, you know, sometimes you're going to have clusters of counties that are different from everybody else. Uh, so a student could try to implement that kind of algorithm. Um, our algorithm considers only two counts at once. Um, why not consider more counts at once and look for outliers or clusters or pairs? Um, why not add in new, new data? We have census data on the, the visualizer for the scatter plots. Um, um, but we haven't integrated any kind of um, outlier detection algorithm that, that recognizes and uses the demographic differences between counties. Um, um, and, or, you know, there's other data that's probably, probably relevant, weather data. Um, that affects, uh, at least rumored, is rumored to affect who gets to, who goes to the polls. Um, uh, COVID data, how did, you know, how did that affect things? Um, and, and then finally, instead of just uh, comparing particular counts, uh, are there ways to compare uh, ratios of counts or ratio, yeah, ratios of counts, ratios of ballot counts to ballot counts, ratios of census counts to census counts, or, you know, uh, sky's the limit. So uh, that is, the vote visualizer. Uh, that is the work we did to help protect the 2020 election, to help consolidate election data in a form that more people can use it. Um, and um, there it is. And I am really looking forward to questions. All right. Well, Let's do the awkward thing where we all clap in the privacy of our own. <laughs> um, okay, so we got lots and lots of interesting questions. I'm going to try to group them um, to make it easier for you to address a few of the themes. So a number of people were asking about some details of the outlier algorithm that you just outlined. Is there a readme in the GitHub or is there another place where people can see that written down so they can find out more about the details? Yeah, um, so there is a readme in the GitHub and I, I, I honestly don't remember whether I posted the write-up of that algorithm. It's also going to be in the MAA focus you know, next month or the month after, I think. Um, and I can, I can uh, I'm putting on my to-do list to make sure that there's the algorithm write-up. Okay, great. GitHub. So, and then there are a whole range of questions that have to do with particular kinds of uh, instances or scenarios, wondering if you have thoughts on those. So let me go through a few. Yeah. Um, so R. Peter DeLong asks, um, in, if you look at the time series vote tallies for this recent election, there were numerous reversals of the tallies. You might expect that the uh, changes to the tallies would just make vote totals go up, but they sometimes went down. Do you happen to know what was going on? Pennsylvania was the most notable case. Um, yeah, so I 
don't recall the exact explanations for exactly um, for this particular election and particularly for Pennsylvania, but um, um, it so it, it can things like things like the following can happen that um, uh, several voting machines are sent to a there's a polling place that has several precincts. Uh, so there's there are voting machines sent out for for each of those precincts, and somebody gets confused and deploys deploys voting machine A in, in precinct B and vice versa. And so um, at some point that needs to get corrected, and that can look like the vote totals in one of those precincts went down. Great. Um, another question, Dana McKenzie is asking about Iowa District 2, which is still really an interesting case. Um, there's a, right now at this point, there's a margin of six votes between the two candidates for a congressional seat. And the question is, did verified voting flag anything there as suspicious before uh, errors were discovered or any, anything to say about Iowa 2? I do not have anything to say about Iowa 2. Um, if we... Uh, <laughs> um, if we hadn't had that technical flub, I would go live to actually, why don't I do that while we're talking? I'll go see, um, see what the, the visualizer has to say about Iowa too. Great live demo. Um, but keep, keep talking because. Okay, you bet. Um, so, um, another question coming from John Thompson is why are you focused on counties rather than precincts? Ah, no, that, I love that. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, why are we focused on counties rather than precincts? So we wanted a realistic goal for 2020. We wanted something that we knew we could get done. Um, and uh, the whole project started in, in October of 2019. So it, it's a pretty short timeline. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and also the other thing is that almost every, actually every jurisdiction reports by county, unless they're so small, like the District of Columbia or, uh, or, or Guam or, or, you know, American Samoa, right? You know, the, you, you just get a list of like the seven polling places in American Samoa um, or the seven towns. Anyway, but the point is that, that every jurisdiction reports by county or something like a county. Um, and whereas getting the precinct level results is really difficult. Um, and um, it's definitely something that I'm looking forward to doing is getting more precinct level results and getting those precinct level results in time, right? In time. Um, and also I'm really looking forward to working with Moon because Moon understands precincts and, uh, and, and <laughs> Also, you know, how precincts change over time, that's, that's just like a nightmare. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, but a really, really rich, powerful thing, if we can do it, um, to have a sense of, an, of especially, uh, yeah, uh, having a sense of some kind of predictive model for how precincts, uh, you know, which precincts ought to behave the same will be a really powerful way to look for uh, uh, signs that, that, you know, you know, outliers that, that we, that, that deserve explanation. Right. Yeah. TLDR precincts are a nightmare. Um, <laughs> Dan yeah. asks a question about ballot stuffing. So he asks, if you're looking for outliers and mostly you're looking at ratios, um, what if, but have you thought about whether that can pick up things like ballot stuffing that might not change the ratio, but would just change the overall number coming from a particular place? Oh, yeah. So, um, so we have, so in the, in the part where we're automatically curating outliers, we're so far just looking at, at uh, candidate counts one versus the other. So, um, so that's, that might not show up. Um, but that could be looking at total, total counts, um, could be done, um, total counts versus voter registration that could be done. Um, um, I would be amazed to, uh, <laughs> just 
why would someone stuff a ballot box unless they were stuffing it for a particular candidate? I don't know. <laughs> but 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 this, well, this is you're in a heavily democratic place and you just magnify the number of votes but not the ratio, you're still benefiting your candidate. Ah, yes, yes. The, the question was like, let's look at all, at uh, Chicago in the mid 20th century in the daily machine that was part of it. Of, of right, the, right. Okay, great. Um, so there are, uh, there were a few, I think you addressed this, but there, there were a few questions about scenarios with more than two candidates like California and Louisiana have jungle primaries and primaries in general can have lots of candidates. Have you done much thinking about primaries? Uh, so the system works just as well for primaries as it does for generals, and we do have some data from the um, from the 2020 primary. Um, does, did I fully answer the question? Is it more to it than well, that? I think also, it's about when you don't just have a Democrat and a Republican, but you might have a more complicated slate of candidates. Yeah, so the system actually doesn't favor Democrats and Republicans, you know, sort of internally. The system actually compares every candidate to every other candidate, or sorry, it compares every candidate to the winner. Um, and and the, the practical idea is that if, if we're really looking to protect elections, the only things that matter are, um, um, you know, a loser, a losing candidate who might turn into a winning candidate. Um, and there are some contests that have more than one winner and and there's you know so there's some complications there but um yeah so so this really this really does apply to uh uh it's just as useful for primaries as it is for general elections sounds good okay well looking at the time there are a lot of great questions in here but um there are several coming from nina white and i'm happy to see congressman jerry mcnerney is also one of our attendees because he put a uh, comment praising this tool into the chat. But Nina asks, are there any national legislative efforts to standardize the format of the data and who collectively works on these issues? And so I thought maybe we'd give you an opportunity to comment on that uh, with a congressman in the audience. <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, NIST is doing the, the bulk of the work. And um, actually, you know, it occurs to me, you know, there's real, there's, it's, it's very, it's very hard to find useful federal things to do about elections other than give money because, uh, because the control of elections is so jealously guarded by the states. Um, and um, uh, I mean, there are a couple tools that the federal government does have um, about, uh, uh, I mean, you know, so the Constitution gives the federal government some ability, but it's it's you know there's there's the legal ability and then there's the political ability to do stuff. Um, and you really have to get the people who actually do the work of running the elections on board. Um, but it strikes me that actually the next time any kind of amount of money or legislation goes in, um, requiring states to um, to publish their election results in the NIST data format, um, that's not such a big ask for them, for the yeah. states. Oh. And it, it would be huge for, for election protection. Yep. Um, we're just about out of time, but I'll just add to that, that in the last Congress, the first you know, House bill number one had a lot of language addressing election reform. Now there's an opportunity for a new uh, round of legislation on this. And so Congressman McNerney, uh, talk to us. We'd love to, <laughs> we'd love to chat with you about data transparency provisions that might be appropriate at the federal level. Okay, so now I can tell you from a huge number of folks who are posting in chat and in Q and A, um, a typical comment is this is amazing, Stephanie. Thank you and your team for this work. So lots of appreciation coming from this audience and thank you for a terrific talk. Thank you. All right, everyone, have a great day.